I'm Adam Shanks. I am the Ag and Natural Resources Educator in Clinton County, Indiana, which is central Indiana. And today we're going to talk about wonderful uh, pesticide labels and their uses and functions uh, as we start to apply pesticides. So to start out with, we're going to do a little bit of a review of last time's uh, topic and also maybe just lay some uh, groundwork or some foundation about uh, pesticides and their labels. So pesticides uh, can be used two different ways. There's preventive treatment, which will prevent a pest problem from occurring. So you put this down ahead of time uh, before there's a problem to prevent the problem from happening. Or there's a rescue treatment, which is the problem has already occurred, the pest is there, now we have to eradicate it. So the very first step in pest control is you got to identify the pest correctly. You don't know what to treat with if you haven't properly identified um, the insect, the fungus, the, um, the weed, whatever it is that you're trying to eradicate. You have to identify it first uh, to properly find the right product to use. So obviously if you misidentify what you're trying to treat, you can have some real problems, as in this cat that they found. So pesticide labels, first and foremost, are made to keep everybody safe, keep the environment safe, keep the handlers safe. Um, everything that you need to properly do to utilize that product safely is, is gonna be found on the label. Again, th safety includes safety to yourself, safety to others, safety to your desirables. So you don't wanna kill the, the, the grass in your yard, you wanna kill the dandelions, or you don't wanna kill your roses, you wanna kill the thistles that are around them. So you gotta make sure you're gonna be safe to the desirables, safety to non-target organisms, and, and obviously uh, environmental safety. So we've stepped away, I guess, from days of this. Uh, I love the sign on the side of the truck, powerful insecticide, harmless to humans. So we've gotten a little bit more wise since this picture was taken about how to properly use insecticides or any sort of pesticide. So what is a pesticide? Okay, well it's any product that claims to kill, repel, or otherwise disrupt the life cycle of a living organism. Examples include insecticides, uh, miticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, and algicides. Uh, so the aside obviously is a Latin to mean to kill, so it kills insecticides, mites, herbs, fungus, rodents, and algae. So at the very top level at the national side there are laws that affect pesticides and their use. Uh, on the national level, level, the governing body for that is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA. And that is, um, I guess, policed or maintained by the EPA, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. And then more on a local level, uh, those laws are put into place maybe changed a little bit more for local needs, but those are administered and policed or maintained by the Office of the Indiana State Chemist, uh, which is located at, on Purdue's campus. But basically, it mirrors the FIFRA um, laws, but like I said, with some local flair for Indiana. And I'm sure if you're not in Indiana, you'll have a, a state governing body for the pesticides wherever you're located as well.
So some of the provisions for FIFRA uh, requires that all pesticides are labeled. And that makes the label a legal document, which is must be followed. You'll hear me say this once, you'll hear me say this twice, you'll be sick of hearing me say this by the time this calls over, the label is the law. You must follow the label, that is the law. But on the flip side of that, courts have said this also makes the label a warranty. So if you followed the label, applied like it's supposed to, um, followed everything that it says, and you have a failure, well now you've got a warranty claim that hey, I did everything I'm supposed to and these weeds escaped or um, this algae didn't go away. You, you've got a warranty there to go back to the manufacturer uh, to stand on. Um, it also classifies pesticides into two main categories. General use, which you can buy um, openly at any sort of store or restricted use which you have to have a label or a, a license um, that you've taken an exam and have a little bit more understanding uh, about how to use that product, how to mix that product, how to handle that product, how to dispose of it. Uh, just a little bit more intensive training involved to get the restricted use license. Again, here's the restricted use pesticide. So they've had, uh, they've shown to have serious harm to human health or the environment if not used or handled properly. And so you must take an exam and have a license to purchase these types of products. So now we'll get into what's actually on a pesticide label. Uh, and generally all labels will have these two terms on them. Uh, it's a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. The label is the law. And then obviously, keep out of reach of children will be on the very front. So there's four common types of information on the labels. You have your safety information. Uh, you have so, such as reentry intervals, uh, equipment to wear, PPE equipment required, environmental information, uh, the product information. So it's formulation, uh, it's active ingredients, and then also the use. So what weeds does this control or what, what does this product control? How do I apply it? How much do I apply? Those kind of things. So you'll see on there four uh, main signal words and these tell you the immediate uh, risk or danger of that product. So at the highest risk is danger slash poison It'll obviously have a skull and crossbones. These are highly toxic. Uh, it may, you know, it takes a very little bit to be toxic uh, to a human. Then just a step below that is danger, uh, corrosive to skin uh, or an eye irritant. So most of these products will be, have to have, uh, will be a restricted use product. So you'll have to have a special license to buy and apply uh, most of these types of products. And then the four, the last of the four uh, is warning, moderately toxic, uh, a taste to an ounce may kill an adult, and then caution, so slightly toxic, uh, an ounce or more. So all are still very dangerous. You don't want to um, be careless and uncautious when handling these products. Uh, it just gives you a quick glance that, man, we really, really, really need to be cautious with this one or... Um, you know, we just need to really just be careful with this one. So again, at the safety information, it'll have your PPE requirements for that product. Uh, so minimum clothing that's, that's assumed to be on a label, you want to wear a long sleeve shirt, you want to have waterproof shoes, and you want to have long pants. So that way, if some of this stuff splashes out, you're just minimizing the amount of skin that's exposed uh, that can absorb this chemical if, if you get a splash. So on the label, um, you'll have some different, if it's a really toxic, like if you had the skull and crossbones, it's going to require some more protective equipment to wear. Uh, things like me have to have a respirator, goggles. I, I think goggles are always a must because that stuff may want to tend to want to splash 
uh, as you're as you're mixing, uh, or even if you're spraying with a hand or something like that, it, the wind can want to blow that stuff around a little bit. Uh, rubber boots, aprons to wash off and keep the uh, the products off your clothes, uh, and gloves. Gloves are are always a must in handling any sort of pesticide. Chemical resistant, not latex. So there again, it, you know, gloves should be considered a minimum in protective equipment. And we'll talk a little bit more about glove types here later on. Oh, okay, now, so gloves, chemical resistant with no lining. So I have several gloves at home um, that have a, they have like a, they're rubber, but they have like a fur lining inside. Not, it's not fur, but like a cloth lining inside. And those, you don't want those because if, the chemical gets on that lining, there's nowhere for it to go. It stays trapped in that fabric and just holds it against your skin. So you have a, a greater chance of it um, causing injury because it's a, actually inside your glove being held against your skin. So having a glove with no lining will be able to quickly rip it off and wash off um, the contaminant. So again, on a label, Right in, right uh, inside or very close to the front will be the safety uh, first aid information. Basically, it'll tell you uh, what you need to do should emergency arise. And just a pro tip, um, if you're using pesticides of any kind, take, have the label uh, handy or take a picture of it on your phone that way, if something does happen and you have to go to the hospital, the having, a, having the label or a picture of the label can quickly tell the doctors what treatment you need. Um, the EPA registration number will tell them what the formulation of that uh, chemical or pesticide is, and then they will know what they need to do to treat it. So I know in an emergency, you're not thinking to do that. So if you're using something, just take a picture and have it on your phone. Um, or like I said, just have those labels handy so you can grab them and go if there's an emergency. And many products have, a, have an 800 a telephone number. Um, you can call and ask for safety questions. Re-entry level, we talked about this um, in the safety side of it. So this is if you treat an area, treat your lawn, treat your flower bed, treat your garden, how soon can you re-enter that area? You'll find this on your label. Uh, if nothing is listed, generally it's assumed that the label or that the, the product is safe um, shortly after application. Uh, if it's a, a emulsified liquid or liquid, as soon as it dries, it's safe to re-enter. So yeah, the, also, um, so this is the harvest interval. This is the amount of time you must wait. So if you treat your garden uh, with something for worms or fungus, this is how long you have to wait before you can harvest that uh, fruit and eat it. Um, it's uh, basically, you know, you don't want to contaminate anything you're going to eat or sell. So you want to make sure that you're following what the label says uh, about harvest. If you've got something you need to harvest in the next 30 days, and the harvest interval is 45 days, then you should probably look at a different product. Some more safety information, uh, environmental um, hazard statements. So, you know, if it's toxic to bees, fish, uh, don't apply within 10 feet of surface water. If you've got a pond or something around, all of these, all this information will be found in the label. Endangered species, I think there's uh, one county in Indiana that has a endangered species. So, um, but Indiana, you generally don't see a, a statement like this for products, but um, definitely something to be aware of uh, if you are in other states to take a look at um, before you're applying product. So on the very front, um, you can get into the basic names of the product. So you've got your brand name. Uh, or in this case, we're using seven, you know, the, the powder you apply to your garden. The 
common name, and then the chemical active ingredients. So you can actually have um, a common name and the chemical name be the same, but have a different brand name. So you can have a different company uh, that's supplying the same product. So you really got to look at your common name and chemical names to make sure that you're getting uh, what you want. The formulation, so is this going to be a ready-to-use solution? Is this a product you pick up off the shelf and take home and apply immediately? Is this a wettable powder? So this is a powder that you have to uh, mix in with water. Same way with an emulsifiable concentrate. So this is, you bought pure glyphosate, you got to mix it in with water uh, to dilute it, to apply it. Or you've got your dust that you can just apply um, right onto the plant. And again, it'll tell you on the label if it's a general use or restricted use. Your manufacturer or packager name and information will be on there. And that's good to have if you have questions about the safety of the product or if you have a, have a warranty claim. Uh, you'll want to have that information right there uh, handy so you can file that or get a hold of them. Uh, the net weight her volume of the package. So is this a, a 12 ounce can of powder? Is this a two and a half gallon liquid? Whatever, whatever product you're buying, the volume and the weight will be on there. And then towards the bottom, you'll have your EPA registration number and your EPA establishment number. So that's specific to the product and then where the product was made. And again, those are what your hospitals and doctors will have information on to have uh, have treatment sources for somebody that's uh, been exposed to these products. Uh, so a physical and chemical hazard statement just tells if the product might be corrosive to equipment or other hazards and then the warranty information you know who to contact if you if the product fails. So on through the label, you'll find directions for use. So what product, what, what uh, pesticide this treats, how much to use, storage and transportation instructions, uh, the re-entry or harvest interval we talked about, and then container disposal. I mean, what do we do with these containers when we're done? Uh, can we burn them? Can we just throw them in the trash? If we have some left, do we dump it down the drain? Um, so all these questions are, are answered uh, within the within the label. So pesticide use refer, refers more than to just using the product. So it also includes the handling, the transporting, the mixing, the loading, the storing, and the disposing of the container that we talked about. So the more of the story, read the entire label. The label is the law. If you're off-label, you're breaking the law. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, the toxicity of a pesticide. Uh, this is the level of the chemical that it takes to be poisonous. The dose um, is related to this. So if you have a large dose, the larger chances of serious consequences. And obviously all chemicals are toxic if enough is taken. So table salt, sodium's toxic. Chloride's toxic. You put them together, you get table salt. So you gotta you gotta understand how all that works. So acute toxicity, that's just a single rapid poisoning. Um, so it can be it's measured actually by the LD50. And what the LD50 is, it's kind of like uh, kind of like your golf score. The lower the the lower uh, the it is. The more toxic. So what it means is, is, is that's the amount of a product it took to terminate 50% of its target. So it took so a lower number means it took less of this product to kill 50% of its uh, target. So that means it's more toxic. So that's why um, you know a lower LD number LD50 number has a more toxic level. There, they have the lower the LD50, the more toxic the product. So this is just an example. Um, 
60 milligrams per kilogram of body weight is more toxic than a product of an LD50 of 1,000 milligrams per, pil per kilogram of body weight. The 60 took less, uh, to, took less product um, to, to cause the damage. The LD50 doesn't usually appear on the label. It's more in the material safety and data sheet, the MSDS sheets. Um, generally, those don't come with the product, but you can find those online. Um, but the best way to just judge is to look for the signal words on the label. Chronic toxicity is a more long-term exposure. Uh, so if you've, you know, over the years been applying the same product and somehow it's it's been getting on your skin or you've been in, inhaling it over the years and now you've got a problem, um, you know, 10 years after you've been using this product, that's more of a chronic issue than acute. We're seeing that with uh, glyphosate lawsuits now. So how do people get exposed to pesticides and chemicals? Most cases are dermal or absorbed through the skin. Um, if you're applying this stuff and you get some of it on your arms or, you know, if you're spraying the driveway in shorts and you get it on your legs, you can feel it blowing onto your legs. You need to stop and put some long pants on or put a long sleeve shirt on. Um, then inhalation or breathing in those fumes is the second most common. And oral is the least, I mean, short of, uh, of uh, you know, drinking the stuff, nobody plans on doing that. So that's the, the least common. So what's your risk? Well, the hazard to your health varies with the toxicity of the product and the exposure you allow yourself to have. Somebody's annotating my screen for me. So yeah, ha your hazard is the toxic toxicity of the product times the amount of time exposed to it. So to limit your risk, you can select the chemicals you use for safety. You can limit your exposure by wearing the appropriate PPE and clothing. Again, the minimum is a long sleeve shirt, long pants, waterproof shoes. You want them to be waterproof so if you get it on your feet, it doesn't absorb in and just stays right there uh, where your feet can absorb it, and gloves. So some labels will tell you, will tell you certain, well, they should all tell you specific uh, PPE to wear. Again, the label is the law, so if you're not actually wearing the proper PPE, you're violating the law. Uh, transporting, so when possible, avoid uh, pesticides in the passenger compartment, try to keep them outside. If not, keep the windows down. Uh, large quantities, you wanna make sure you secure the load. And then the kitty litter can be used if you do um, have any spills to soak up the product. Storage, uh, keep out of the reach of kids, pets, etc. Try to keep them from where they can't freeze. Metal shelves are preferred over wood because if there is a spill, the wood will want to absorb it. Uh, and then you've got a contaminated shelf. Have clean water nearby, well lit, well ventilated area. Clean up. Um, after the application, you want to clean up your equipment, your PPE. And then triple rinse the containers. Uh, I don't know about power rinsing a container, but definitely triple rinse it and dump the wash back into the treated area. Don't dump it in the driveway or out in the yard. Dump the wash out back in the treated area so you're putting it right where you wanted it, right where you were treating anyways. Wash your clothes immediately after you apply a pesticide and do not, uh, do not use wash your family members or other clothes with them, wash them by themselves, and then you should really run a run an empty load through in between to wash out any contaminants before you go back to washing your, your family's clothes. Shower thoroughly uh, after any sort of an exposure. Um, to get that off your skin. So packaging. So we talked a little bit, this is a big deal. The, the, the container disposal. It's not legal to burn pesticide containers in Indiana, uh, even if the label says you can burn the container. So it's not legal to burn those. There's uh, the triple rinse. Again, 
rinse out the containers, apply the contaminant back to the treated area. If it's in a bag, slit it open, empty the remaining contents, dispose of the bag in a landfill. There are some different um, cleanup days that the, the state chemist's office for Indiana has that can take containers or leftover pesticides. It's called the Clean Sweep Program. You can look that up online. They, they like, take the containers or any leftover pesticides um, and dispose of them properly without any questions. So running out of time, um, off-label use, I want to get to some examples of labels since we're not in, um, in person. I took some pictures. Um, just using stuff off-label, you can cause more problems. Um, and again, you don't want to over-apply. You don't want to uh, apply to hard surfaces or driveways where stuff can run. And over water can cause uh, the chemical to move as well. Same way with be aware of the weather, the wind. Uh, if it's too windy, the stuff will move off target. The rain can cause it to wash off and move off target. And temperature, if you're applying a pesticide or herbicide and that plant's not actively growing because it's 40 degrees, you're wasting your money and time because it's not going to uh, take in that that herbicide and do any good. So again, looking where you are environmentally, you know, with water around, um, non-target movement, your PPE. Here's some stuff. You have some, some product left over. Um, find a responsible friend that maybe could use it. Uh, do not pour it down the drain. The wastewater treatment plants, your septic system, do not want that um, pesticide coming through them. So do not pour the chemical down the drain. And then look for community um, talks away days. That's why I was talking about the clean sweep program that Indiana offers to, to remove that stuff. Triple rinse, reapply to the target site. It's in, in Indiana, burning pesticide containers is illegal. So finally, always read and follow all label instructions, directions. The label is the law. So just in the last couple minutes here, I took some examples um, of some labels out in my shop. So to look at this one, I mean, right off the top of your head, you see caution. Keep out of the reach of children. This one um, has three different active ingredients. Oh, my mouse went up. Oh. Here we go. So this one's um, got some metribucin in it for some um, residual control, but there you can see it's a uh, dispersible granules. So this is a granular product um, and it's got its first aid treatment right here on the front. So it just gives you a good idea of what, um, what a basic, this is all right on the front of the container, uh, quick, to, quick and easy to get the information. Here's your EPA registration number and establishment number. So boom, you take a picture of this and you're ready to go if there's a problem. Uh, took this one, this is, uh, again, this, this is a 2,4-D label. It's an emulsifiable liquid. So it's a concentrate that you have to mix with water. It tells you what it controls, its active ingredients. It's a caution. Uh, and then it tells you the there's the EPA registration number, I think. Yeah, I did that. EPA registration number, and then it's a, it was a two and a half gallon container. Then inside the first page here is the first aid, um, what to do if, it, if, uh, if there is contact, personal protective equipment, um, and then it's a caution. The next page talks about spray drift management, droplet size, wind speeds, temperatures, um, the weeds that it's controlled, what equipment to use, how to use that equipment. So this, uh, since we can't be in person, I just thought I'd pull off. Um, this is for, this is just for a 2,4-D product and how you use it through the, through the proper label recommendations. And then you get in here, here's non-agriculture use on in a couple pages. So just some final resources. Um, if you have questions, you can always look up the 
Office of the Indiana State Chemist's Office. Um, the second link is the Purdue Pesticides Program. They have a lot of great information on their website. And then the last bit is my email. If I can, if I can help you with anything, I'd be glad to. So with that, we're right on time. So if anybody has questions, um, Corey, I guess I'd be happy to be available. I don't have any in the chat right now, um, but I don't know if people are thinking. So um, if there's nothing, then okay. don't forget to fill out your um, surveys at the end of this. And right. we will see you again next week um, as we wrap up our series all right well thank you very much for listening today i appreciate it where do you find the survey to fill out that will be coming out in a email here shortly oh. after we conclude thank you, uh, you thank bet. you for, thank you for your time you bet thanks for participating hey adam there is yeah. one question in the chat box here real quick. Okay. Uh, how do you find the best pesticides to use, i.e. to kill daylilies? The best pesticide to use. So you wanna so you wanna look at if that's a broadleaf or a grass, and then you wanna start looking through the label to see uh, if that what that is gonna control. So you need to know where it's at, you know, if it's in your it's in your flower bed you want to be more specific about where you're putting it um, if this is a larger area you can treat it with uh, a more broad scope herbicide but uh, definitely want to just start to look through the labels and find a product maybe do a google search or call your extension office uh, about what uh, what would be the best pesticide to use for that for that situation but you definitely want to look at the whole picture not just just the one one um, problem Hope that helps. Let's see, looks like we're getting some more questions in here. Uh, I'm not sure on the berries. I can definitely look that up if we have your, we can send you an email and let me do some research on that and see what, uh, what we can find for you on that. That was Deb. Let me write that down. <laughs>